What's up, guys? Welcome to the podcast. My name is Saul Monley at Saul Monley NBA on Twitter. Here, joined by Forrest Walker at Do Nots on Twitter. How you doing, Forrest? Hey, not too bad. I have a nice Sunday off, and I'm spending it with you. I'm glad you're spending it with me. I'm glad you're spending it with me because I'm very excited to be spending my Sunday with you. Uh, first, Aww. I want to apologize for the long layoff. Uh, I've uh, I've got to do better at, at being more regular with these uploads. Uh, but we're back today, uh, and I want to talk about uh, three things. First. If you're a fan of the channel, be sure to subscribe and give us a thumbs up on this video. That really goes a long way to helping others find it. Uh, but yeah, I want to talk about three things today. Great. Uh, first, I want to talk about Rafael Stone uh, and his tenure as GM of the Rockets. I wrote an article analyzing his tenure and gave him a grade. It got a lot of traction. A lot of people seem to disagree with it. Some people agreed with it. We'll get into it. Uh, second, I want to talk about Jalen Green. Uh, my thoughts on his kind of sort of play for the season, his role on the team. Uh, what we think um, about his season and, and his place on the roster long term. Um, and lastly, I want to talk about Tari Eason, uh, who was declared out for the season last night by Ime Udoka. He's going to have season-ending lower leg surgery. Let's start there for us. Uh, yeah, let's start there. First, uh, I just want to say this is such a bummer. Um, much like a lot of people, I was super excited by Tari Eason's play last year and was really looking forward to seeing a full second year with him. Uh, and it's unfortunate that we're getting robbed of that, uh, particularly Tari himself, right? He's the kind of guy who strikes me as always wanting to be out there. Uh, so you know it's going to be a – it's been a rough year for him, and it's going to be another rough four months for him. Uh, so thoughts out to him. Uh, I only have one reaction, and that this, this sucks. Uh, and it can't be good for the team's defense to close the year. Uh, I suspect that Eason – was on track to have his role increased uh, in a pretty significant way uh, before the injury happened, or got re-aggravated, rather. Uh, and it just sucks that we're going to have to wait another year to see one of the most exciting young players on the team. Yeah, he had a real role. He was good at it. Uh, he made sense to the team. He was, what, only in the second year? Fantastic. Right. I mean, this. All right, I want to say long-term, this is not that worrying. That is the, the upside of this, is that from what it looked like, it, it seemed like he had some kind of a bone growth on his shin, is what they said. There's a benign bone growth was the, the term they use. So it sounds like there was just like a bone spur that got hit, and it was... So that, in retrospect, that makes it all make sense. It was a pain tolerance thing. It wasn't like it was threatening him or anything. It just hurts really bad when you have bone stabbing through your flesh. Uh, and that this will... And it sounds like they're sanding it off so that this will not be a problem going forward. This will just resolve it forever. Uh, it also makes sense why, you know, we, there's been a lot, there have been a lot of talk about, like, did they handle this properly in the off season? Could they have done better by letting him, you know, like, how are the, how are the Rockets handling this injury? What's going on with this? And all that's pretty clear now that, like, once we know this is a bo- like a, like a, a benign bone growth issue, they're handling it. It makes sense. It actually, like... The silver lining is that, yeah, he will be back. He'll be fine. This doesn't seem like it's going to affect his long-term health at all. And the Rockets' treatment of this is no longer suspect. Like, in context, the stuff they did is reasonable. So that's good to know. Uh, it does suck that it's going to hurt the team's quality and hurt his chance to get minutes playing in the NBA. The more minutes, the better. But I don't think it's going to like seriously hinder his development it just kind of sucks it just kind of sucks is the deal and it's not fun to watch a team not be as good as they could be there's only no reason not to be as good as they could be this year it isn't it isn't like they're i mean i guess they could get a top four draft pick and retain this pick this year but like that's not it's very secondary so it's kind of a bummer uh it was a really fun team when he was playing he really fit in well and complimented the guys and uh, yeah, I'm sad we're not gonna see him for, until you know next uh, until next season until like October or whatever. So, best of luck to him. I hope his heal his uh his healing process is fantastic, and I look forward to him being back on the court. Yeah, it does say something that we both kind of talked about his injury impacting the Rockets this season. Like this is a second year player, right? And, yeah. and we're both <laughs> like, oh, this is gonna like hurt them, right? Just missing him and like. That's how good he was. I mean, to, to be frank, he was arguably the best defensive player on the team. Um, he, he, he was <laughs> yeah. really, really good. And I, I 
hinted at it earlier. I really thought that he had a chance to take Jalen Green's starting spot before he got hurt. Like, I, I thought that was kind of the, the trajectory. It seemed like he was the guy closing games consistently, um, and it seemed like, okay, if the Rockets are going to go in that direction, Eason's the guy that's going to step up um, and take that role. Uh, and this kind of – this might be another reason not to do that. We're, we're going to talk about Jalen in a second. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna definitely I think uh, impact their play this year. I I, mean, I think he was probably if we're being really honest, he was probably one of the four or five most impactful players on the team. I mean, he was really yeah. really impactful, uh, surprisingly so. I mean, if you look at the way his team plays too, they're honestly a pretty scrappy team. They're just not good enough. Like every they're in they're in every game. They just usually lose them because they're just. They're just young and not quite talented enough, and those things are going to change over time. But I think that his inclusion, if he had not missed games this year, which, you know, most players miss games, but if he had a normal year instead of this injury, this team is pro- this team probably has, what, like five more wins or something? Five. Like, okay. I, That's pretty... Okay. I mean, I don't know. Well, yeah. He's a big part of it, and they lose games by, like, three points constantly. Like, if the, yeah. team's, if the team is a little better, they have a lot more wins. So, I mean... No, I don't they're, think it's crazy. Definitely, I, I take it back. Yeah. I don't think that's that crazy. Yeah, yeah. I think they're a lot closer to five hundred now. I think they're like right around five hundred instead of being a bit below it. With if they have him the whole season, so it's a bad beat for them. Uh, it's a bad beat for him. It's a bad beat for everyone. And you know, I don't know what to say about it. That uh, I'm just glad he'll be healthy next season. Yeah, I mean, he was probably the best rookie on the team last year, right? Uh, and he was easy, yeah. I mean, in summer league, it looked like he was neck and neck with Jabari in terms of how good he was in summer league, and it, that's that's why this sucks, right? It's because we all think he has crazy high potential. Uh, it's unknown, you know, how high he eventually reaches in the NBA, but I mean, it it sucks. We're, we're getting robbed of a second year. I mean, it's you're, you're right in that long term, it doesn't really hurt them. This is not a contract year for. Atari, so it's not going to hurt him really. Um, it's just um, it's it's going to be just rough for the next four years to watch the Rockets without Tari. I mean, it's, I I still rather enjoy watching the Rockets to be honest. Like I I, I as rough as this year has been, uh, I mean, just recently, right? It's it's gotten rough recently. I still enjoy the, watching this them calendar I, I, year has right. been rough. Yeah, as, as rough as this calendar year, twenty twenty four has been. I still enjoy watching them because I still learn something every game watching them, right? Which where like the lot some of the older Rocket seasons, I felt like I was learning nothing, right? <laughs> this year, I feel like yeah. there's a third of thumbs up. Yeah, this year I feel like I'm genuinely, you know, <laughs> taking stuff in. Yeah, I mean, unlike the previous seasons, the, the last few tanking seasons were, yeah, there was really nothing to take away from it. There's something to learn. It's also the, the reason that they're frustrating this year. Like they weren't frustrating the last couple of years. They were just boring. There was just nothing to be gained from it. Now they're kind of frustrating, but that's an upgrade because it means that you can see what they could be doing and what they w- that they might and will be capable of doing, but they're not quite there yet. So, watching them lose games that like they should be able to win in like a year or two is tough, but it's a lot more fun than watching them just absolutely get cream because they don't know what they're doing. So I, I will say this: I did find them frustrating the, the past two years because <laughs> there were some obvious moves just on the table that they wouldn't do. They refused to do. Uh, but uh, that's more of a Silas thing, right? Not a not a players yeah. thing, right? Like the players were just they were just doing whatever they could. Let's move on to Jalen Green. So he's had an interesting last two games, possibly his best game yes. of the season last night. Uh, 34 points, 9 rebounds, 4 assists, 12 of 23 from the field, 6 of 12 from 3 point range, 4 of 4 from the free throw line, plus 17 for the game in 37 minutes. That's a, yeah. not a team high. Dylan Brooks was a plus 21, but it's team second high, right? I need your opinion on something, Boris. Yeah, tell me. Because I, I feel bad asking this question, but I, I do want a third party perspective here. Is it cynical to be kind of unmoved by these Jalen Green, you know, outbursts? Because my thing is, this dude. Go ahead, answer that question, and, and okay. then yeah. I all right. Short answer. No, with a but. Long answer. Yes, because. Uh, 
And I'll give you the longer answer, which is that it is cynical to feel that way, but I think the cynicism is earned, if that makes sense. I mean, we had a very similar conversation a while ago where we mulled over the question, maybe he's just streaky. Maybe he's just an inconsistent guy. And that jibes with what we've seen with him. So, yeah, I think I'm with you in as much as when he has bad games, good games, like when he has like highs and lows, that doesn't really change my opinion of him because I know I already knew he could have highs and I already knew he's going to have a lot of lows too. If he can stay on some like mediums to highs, right? If he can stay like good to great instead of like great to bad, that's a different matter. So I kind of agree with you in that until he can kind of, until his like bad games are still okay, right? Until he stops having quite so many and they're not quite so disastrous this is still like progress but it's not really a change in like our schema of of what he is like as a player i totally agree here's my thing this dude consistently leads the team in field goal attempts per game despite being far from the most efficient scorer (laughs) on the team right it's not crazy to me that he has these performances every now and then like what's more notable to me is how infrequent they are despite how often he shoots the ball, right? Here's a crazy stat for us. Jalen Green is bottom four in true shooting percentage on this team. The th- the only, there are only th- three other players shooting worse than him, and here, here are they. Jean- Jonathan Williams, who has logged a total of 76 minutes this season, Boban Marjanovic, who has logged a total of 48 minutes this season, and Jock Londale, who's just not good. Uh, he's logged a yeah, total of... Like- 305 yeah. minutes this season, right? Literally every other rotation player on this roster is scoring more efficient than him this season. And that's his role in the team, efficient scoring, yeah. right? I know there are people who may latch on to these performances and allow it to feed into their Jalen Green confirmation bias. And I get, like, listen, I'm not, like, off on Jalen Green, the prospect, but I'm still lo- finding myself lower on him by the se- as the season advances. I'm yeah. kind of unmoved for us. Like, in fact, um, and I'm writing an article on this right now. I don't believe Jalen Green should be starting anymore. Um, I think he's been given enough time in, to grow in that grow into that role. I think the Rockets are doing a disservice by forcing the issue. Pretty much everyone who watches the team or is aware of the team knows he's starting purely for political reasons at this point. And there are just too many young prospects that are better than him right now including Cam Whitmore and Amen Thompson. So I just don't know what we're doing right now. Like, are we just going to wait? Are, is the idea here that, oh, he'll eventually be there, so let's just keep him there. Is, is that what they're thinking? Because I'm not sure if he'll eventually be there. I, all right. So to play the other side for a minute, I so thinking to me has to be something like this, right? He's still young. Like, he's been moving more in the right direction than the wrong direction. Though I think we both agree that he's kind of treading water overall for the middle part of this season. But it's it's more good than it is bad, I think. Uh, but I think the math is that there's not really a ton to lose by letting him just re- remain as a starter for the time being until like the end of the season. Like Especially with the situation with the team, like it, it doesn't really matter how many games they win right now. They're not, they're not going to make the play in like, unless some things get pretty wacky. And uh, if they, I mean, if they do become a threat to make the play in, that means things have gone really well, right? So, and if they w- lose a lot of games and trying this experiment, it's not a big deal. And Amen and Cam are young enough that like it's not really going to be an ego hit to them yet. For them to be benched over the other guys currently, so I think practically the math kind of suggests that well, even though you don't necessarily think that Jalen's going to do what you need him to do, it, it's probably worth the chance of letting him like have the rest of the season to prove whether or not he's the, a starter for this team, and then come bra- back around to it on the summer and see and you know and see what's up. Though the problem is that kicking that can down the road does. But there's a can this season that you got that will have to either be addressed or even more egregiously kicked down the road this summer. But that's that's a that's a three months away problem. So you mentioned how there's nothing to lose, and this strikes me as an argument that I heard a lot during 
the Alper and Shangun fiasco these past three years, right? There's nothing to <laughs> lose by like playing guys who are worse than this player or giving opportunities that are worse than this player more opportunities, right? And like I always ended up with that stuff is like we're just wasting time, right? Like I need I I want this data, right? Like this I, this stuff with Cam and a man is fascinating to me. I want more volume to confirm whether or not what I think is the case is the case. Because right now, what I think is the case is that Jalen Green's the third best guard prospect on this team right now. That's what I think is the case. I want I want data to confirm that, but I won't get that data if they keep doing this, right? Because yeah. it's so easy to just write it off, right? A man in Cam's play by oh they're not even playing that many minutes. Well. They're not playing that many minutes because they're not playing the best players right now, right? They're not playing the best performers right now, it seems like. And if, if, we're, if we're just going to yeah. keep going through this cycle, I'm consistently going to hear that answer, right? So I want to well, see the data. The other, side of, the other side of it is that there is something to lose, like you said, which is that you do want to see Cam and Amen get a chance to do what they can do. We do need to see who can do what. We need to find out who's the best. We need to find out what's going to the team's plan going forward. I do think that... And and that the reason that they're keeping Jalen Green starting is largely out of vanity. Whether it's his own, or uh, or Rafael Stone, or the front office, or the ownership more generally, it does seem like sort of a not wanting to give up on an investment. Which, again, I understand you... you I kind of feel like a happy medium is to pull Jalen's minutes back or do whatever you need to do to make sure that Amen and Cam are playing more than they're playing. They need to play more. They need to play as much as their conditioning can handle, honestly. Like, they need to be playing a full 36 or whatever. Whether it's 30, 36, I, you know, I don't know where they're at. But wherever they're at is how much they should be playing. Because, yeah, they are extremely promising. And they do look extremely good for how old they are. And it does not matter if rookies are tanking the season anymore. We're past the part where we, like... That ship sailed. It's not a big deal. Just like play the guys you need to play, develop the guys you need to develop, and let's like let's see how this turns out. Counterpoint: I kind of feel like the happy medium is benching, and the extreme was trading him. Right, the overreaction move would have been to trade him. And like the, this, this you know, going into the trade deadline, I was like, yeah, I'd rather not just just give up on the dude. I'd rather just have him go to the bench, right, and and like play the better players. But that I don't know, like. I hear what you're saying, right? There's no, there's not much harmful, but I do feel like we're wasting time. And that frustrates me because I feel like we wasted a lot of time in this rebuild, right? We wasted a lot of time with Shingu, right? Yeah, it's rebuilds, baby. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, no, I, I hear what you're saying, but like we, we wait, this, this organization's already wasted time in collecting the wrong kind of data, right? I didn't need to see more Bruno Fernando, right? To know <laughs> what I thought of him, right? I, I wanted to see more Shingu. I need to see more Cam, right? I need to see more Amen. I need to see those guys in the most important uh, moments, right? And I feel like with Jalen, it's like, yes, you're right. They're trying to protect their investment, but but how exactly is that working? Are other GMs not watching Jalen Green? Like this idea that, that, that people are going to change their mind if he's a bench player versus as a starter? Like I don't – I think I that's mean, kind of, you know – It's not It's not about people's minds. I think – Oftentimes, when you make a decision like that, it's just about personal pride. It's about you know Jalen Green's con- personal pride. It's about, okay. Yeah, and it's about like the front office personal pride. You know, they it it sucks to say that like this isn't going to work out. And I understand that if there's if there is reasonable hope that it might work out after all, which I think there still is. All right, like I don't want to foreclose on Jalen Green entirely because he's still pretty young. I'm not doing that. But right. But like. I, I think it makes sense that you don't want to... Th- it is a Rubicon. Benching him is a Rubicon that you cannot go back from, right? Once you've crossed there, you've crossed there. You've said to him, you are underperforming our expectations. It is clear. And I you know, they, I think they want to avoid that as long as possible. They don't want to have that blow to his confidence. They don't want to have that blow to their own personal pride. It's... It, I'm not saying you're right or wrong about whether we should do this. In fact, it, it likely is better long term, but the like intangible effects from it are just like nasty to think about. It's a bad vibes move, unfortunately, and I don't think they want to do that, even though maybe they should. 
Like, people do a lot of things that they don't do a lot of things they should do and vice versa because of, you know, personal pride and emotional reasons. So I get it. I understand why they're do why they're doing this. I think it makes sense why they're continuing to start him. Uh, I feel like... I feel like what could have made this all easier a long time ago is to have a much more rotating lineup. I mean... I'll say Saimu Doka, who does he does play whoever he feels like at end, at the end of a game, right? He, he'll just swap it around, whatever. He uh, he he does not subscribe to a prescribed end of game lineup or like crunch time lineup. But it would be nice if they changed opening like like starting rosters more often, so that it would be less of an insult, if that makes sense, right? Like if it was common for guys to swap out from to see who has who has what abilities, fine. But they didn't start out doing it. This isn't a year where they were swapping out starting lineups, so contextually benching Jalen Green would be telling him that you are not up to our expectations and we are disappointed in you. I don't know if that's the Rubicon though. I agree that it may hurt it may hurt his confidence. But like a lot of the theory behind Jalen Green the prospect was his kind of supreme confidence. Right? So if you still believe that in that, then this shouldn't hurt it. Right, it shouldn't, and in fact, it should actually be better for him because he's playing against worse defenders. Right, he's playing in more advantageous positions versus what he's having to do right now, and you know, if the if the if the idea there is like, oh, like we can't come back from this, I just I don't know. I, I think you can come back from this if if he plays good enough. Why why can't you just go back, you know, a few months later, or you know, to start next year? Who like th- this idea that. This is like a permanent. This would be a permanent move. Well, it's a, it's only a permanent move if if he continues playing like this, right? Um, playing like this as in what he's played for the majority of the season, right? Um, it can be something that he rebounds from or that he finds motivation from, right? I just, um, in terms of like the organization, I don't think they should be worried about having egg on their face, right? Like you. It's fine to make these mistakes. What's 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 not fine is to double down on these mistakes. And I guess we can use this to transition into Rafael Stone. Let's talk about Rafael Stone. So we're approaching the four year mark of when Daryl Morey stepped down as GM of the Rockets and Stone really took four his place. Years. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. That, where does the time go, Solomon? Where does it go? I don't know. I don't know. It's, <laughs> it, it's, it feels like it happened like a year ago. So I wrote an article for com, kind of analyzing and grading his tenure in, in totality. And I really wanted to step back and take like a holistic view on what he's done in, in his role as GM. Uh, and more, more importantly, I wanted to tackle the question, like, are the Rockets in a better position than where they were four years ago? And should Stone receive a contract extension? Uh, now, to be clear, I don't really know what Stone's contract status is because the Rockets never disclosed it when he first took the job. But I'd imagine it's about a four- to five-year deal because uh, that's kind of standard for NBA GM contracts, yeah. right? But before I kind of tell the listeners what I gave as a grade for Stone in that article, Forrest... What are your thoughts on Stone's tenure as GM of the Rockets? Uh, Alright, I'll start off with a letter grade. My overall letter grade for Rafael Stone over the last few years is a B. Which I think is very fair. I think he's done pretty well. Uh, mostly, mostly good. Uh, meets expectations for sure. Does not exceed expectations. I don't, I'm not going to give him a B plus or, or in any kind of an A because he has not... He has not exceeded expectations. To be fair, Houston's expectations are always pretty high. Houston is a needy fan base and a needy team. Uh, it does not imagine itself as being like a loser or, you know, Houston does not. Ha- Houston has things to prove to Houston. The Rockets uh, want to be a quality team. They want to be an exceptional team, and he has been tasked with trying to get them back to quality, to winning fifty plus games. You know, being a real. Being a real quality team in the NBA, the goal is not to just like be kind of okay and sell tickets. This is a team who wants to win, a team who wants to win championships optimally. So he has big shoes to fill, both in terms of his pre- the previous yeah. GM, yeah, his predecessor, and in terms of the expectations for him. So the fact that he's done mostly okay, I think, is 
impressive enough for a B. I don't want to go to a C because C would imply that he has fa like failed to meet expectations, and I think that overall he has done that. However, he he has had some head scratcher moves. There have been some trades that have like there's been a lot of paying to get things and paying to get rid of things type moves. There's there have been a number of all right. The draft picks look good so far, apart <laughs> apart from Jalen Green. Right. The other ones, the other draft, the other players they've moved in a sort of weirdly embarrassing situation to try to land Brooke Lopez, who they failed to land. That's a little embarrassing, but I don't like. This is kind of the vibe I think for Rafael Stone in general. Like you look at the results and say, "This is pretty good. This is overall turning out well. I like this." But then when you start looking at details, you're like, "This is weird how it got done." Like it's weird that they traded away some of these young players, like your Usman Garuba and so on, and you know, guys who honestly were not gonna have a long term future with the team. Like let's be real here; these are the kind of guys that do end up getting moved and just don't end up in the league. But the way they got moved was weird. Right. So, yeah. uh, so I ended up, I did end up giving him a B plus. Um, and I'm with you. I don't think he's been perfect. There have been notable mistakes, uh, none more so than, as you said, uh, selecting Jalen Green at number two in 2021. But as you said, like you do, kind of have to step back, right? And like, yes, you do. You you dig into the weeds, and some of the marginal stuff has been kind of a miss. Like, this is, like some miss, there have been some misses there, right? Particularly, like, okay, if you gave me the Rockets roster and assets, like, if you gave me a list of roster and assets at the start of the 2023 offseason and then gave me that same roster and assets at the end of the 2023 offseason, like, oh, okay, this is pretty interesting. I, I, like, this yeah. is, that's a... Home run, right? Like they, they got Cam Whitmore and a man Thompson in the same draft. Looks like they just traded Usman Garuba yeah. and Josh Christopher and all these seconds for him. Like, and I, I guess I guess they must have traded up for like the tenth pick. But in, <laughs> in reality, like no, he, yeah. he fell for you at he fell uh, for you at twenty, right? And you were still that team that selected him at twenty, and you fought um, against uh, what was the trend there, right? You stopped his fall. Right, and you deserve credit for stopping this fall. Uh, and you made the trade, more importantly, the Eric Gordon trade, that got you in position to be uh, to stop this fall, right? But you could have also just not gone off to Brook Lopez, <laughs> right? Like you had yeah. Shangun in house. I don't understand that whole, you know, debacle. Like I don't, I, I didn't understand. Like their incessant need to go chase the center has been part of my frustrations with Stone. Right, uh, they're kind of they're basically giving a um, a lack of faith in Shingun. They're they're displaying some sort of lack of faith, of faith in Shingun from top to bottom, right? Because year one, uh, it's like they, they were surprised that Shingun was good and that that, that mm -hmm. they were they were going to have to play. I'm, I'm I'm not exaggerating. Yeah. Went into training camp, interviewed Steven Silas, and it's like Silas is surprised that Shingun's having a good training camp. And that he uh, may end up breaking into the rotation, right? And year two, okay, Christian Wood's gone. Um, you know the the pathway has been cleared. Oh, we're going to start the season with Bruno Fernando at center, right? And it's like, yeah, that was a Silas move, but it's still like not particularly comforting that they went after Daniel Tice in the off season. Right, uh, and then the next next summer, they make this huge. What's the word the, I'm looking for? Huge, they clear a path yeah. for Brooke Lopez. They, yeah. they, they make this huge pitch for Brooke Lopez, right? And it, it it fails. And but the fact that they felt they had like how badly they wanted Brooke Lopez is concerning to me, right? Like what they did, what they were willing to do to clear a pathway for him, was concerning to me. But other than that, and the Jalen Green thing, and I would say also how much they did their financial planning around Kevin Porter Jr., which I think is also a ding, right? Other yeah. than those three things, those are the three big dings. I think it's, they're pretty indisputed. Hard to not ding the rock. Hard to not ding the rocket for that. And they, they've kind of killed the job, right? I mean, like the Jalen Green thing, 
Yeah, they missed. Shingu was a home run, slam dunk at number 16. Um, Big time. The, the next year, Jabari Smith and Tar Eason, home run draft. Right? They killed it. Uh, maybe you say they could, they could have gone off for Jalen Williams. You weren't selecting Jalen Williams at number three. <laughs> Don't give me that. That was never in contention. No. Right? Uh, Tar Eason at 17, killed it. The next year, a man at number four and Cam at number 20. Better than what any one of any of us could have ever imagined, right? And then you look yeah. at what they did in the James Harden trade. That was such an important trade. It set the Rockets up for where they're at, and they made the right call, right? Like they made the absolute right call by selecting that package versus a Ben Simmons oriented package, right? And the fact that they were able to get all those picks unprotected, I mean, that's shrewd negotiating. They held out for that long under immense pressure from not only James Harden. But the outside press, right? Everybody was paying attention yeah. to James Harden. Thing. I wanted to make the point that I think that the draft picks are kind of a microcosm for his performance overall, which is similar to what you said, that if you look at the results of these draft picks currently, right, you say, all right, they've picked six guys, like the six, the, the top two picks each year, those six guys, the guys are, are the core six, as we call them, or whatever. Uh Overall, really good. It looks like they hit on five out of the six of them, which is really impressive. And in a very real way, you can measure drafts, draft acumen by, like, the later picks, not the earlier picks, if that makes sense, right? Like, at number three, they were going to take Jabari Smith. Who else were you going to take? There's not another right. option. You right. know, like, and I think Amen is pretty close to that, too, right? Like, when yeah. when he was there at four, how do you not pick him? So that doesn't really, that just shows us they're not, like, Incompetent. That shows that they that they know you know who's the best guy. Obviously, it's the middle ones. Right? So your Shangun is a really impressive draft pick because they got him lower down and made a very smart choice. Whitmore, impressive draft pick. Tari is an impressive draft pick. These everything and it's really very impressive, honestly. Except the first one, <laughs> except the Jalen Green one, where there wasn't actually as much consensus that he was like the clear number two. It was a swing. It was a big swing. Yeah, right. That was so like the one. That, the one time they didn't like of the of the, the high overall draft picks, the one time they they took a bit of a swing. We'll see. Is I guess the way to put that. So, yeah, that's why I yeah I can't give him better than a B. I feel like because they, he does so many things right. This front office does so many things right, and then like they'll just there's just the stuff that like they don't do right, which is funny because it's almost the opposite of the Mori version of the front office where. They were just, like, impeccable with all the little things. All these little deals and all, like, the stuff around the margins. Like, in the details, Maury's front office was always, like, quietly improving their position and was almost impeccable at that stuff. But but I do think Stone... I, I want to push back a little bit there because I do think Stone, okay. in the details, was good too, right? Because, like... Okay, for example, the P.J. Tucker trade, right? The, at the time, the market for P.J. Tucker was two second-round picks. And they managed to find a creative way to get a first rounder out of it by just trading a, 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 an early second and upgrading that second to a first rounder. Um, the Eric Gordon trade was a, a example of the little things, right? And you trade a first rounder for an, a, 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 another first rounder that's 10 picks higher, right? At the time, and it ended up being at, at the end of the season, right? They also got Garrison Matthews off the scrap heap, Jay Sean Tate off the scrap heap, flipped those guys for second round picks, Bruno Fernando off the scrap heap, flipped him for a second round pick. Like, up until this year, they were hitting on the little things, right? For the most part, right? There were, there were misses on some of the little things, right? But they were hitting on little things. It's just those were kind of like minor stories, right? So. I will say, though, I think that uh, Stone has had a better draft history overall than Maury did. And Partially, defensive... though, because... Yeah, you were going to say what yeah, I was going to say. Maury just, like, never had a good draft pick. So, I feel like they were just like, I don't know, man. <laughs> like, well, like Maury didn't, wasn't drafting in top one and two players. He was not He was not at that point. Uh, so, the, the draft is just less important for the Maury Rockets than it has been for the Stone Rockets. Yeah, I mean, Maury was never given the same latitude that... Stone was given. That's a fair yeah. thing to say, right? Like, yeah, he like does, he wasn't allowed to tank out. Yeah, L Les never wanted the Rockets to lose. Uh, Tillman was open to it. Um, and that's credit to Tillman, but that's uh, still something that Stone has had the ability to do that that Maury never did. And that that almost makes what what Maury did with 
the limitations he had even more impressive in retrospect, yeah. right? Like what he was able to build with uh, the leeway that he was given. Uh, pretty impressive. Now, I guess, like, the natural question is like, okay, so I gave him a B plus, you gave him a B. It's not too far off, right? But Yeah, we're in the same zone. Yeah. Would you give him an extension? And where I ended up on that question was like, I'd give him a modest extension. I wouldn't give him something that's too long-term, and I wouldn't give him something that's too rich, right? I'd give him something that's like middle of the pack, uh, in the NBA, and I'd give him like two or three more years. I pack on two or three more years. Yeah. Let's just say this. Let's say his contract ended in 2024, right? This this was the last year. I'd pack on two more years or three more years, and wow. I'm fine with him. You know, seeing the rebuild through. I'm, I I think he's a competent hand. And am I saying he's like Ainge or Mori or Presti level? No. Do I think he can eventually get there? Possibly. I don't think he's done anything that's made him like. Hmm, what's a good? Who's a, who's an incompetent general manager? That's a, um, Rob Palenka, right? Like I don't think he's done anything Rob Palenka bad. Yeah. Right. No. <laughs> right. No. So like like he's clearly above that tier of general managers. Uh, he's not maybe not at the apex like top top level, but he's somewhere below those guys. And I'm I'm, it's just you're more likely to. In the in the range of general manager that Stone currently occupies, you're more likely to get worse at general manager if you fire the top guy than to get better, right? Yeah, and that's well, just where I stand. All right, here's my piece on that, which is all right. I've said it on Twitter, and my stance about general managers and front offices in the NBA is as follows: The Thunder are blowing everyone else out of the water, and it's not close. Like the Thunder going from the, the speed at which they've come back to contention is ludicrous. And everyone else should just be, uh, I guess, writing letters of apologies to their fans that they're not able to do such a thing. That being said, there's only one Sam Presti out there. You know, there's like, well, I think that every and, and it took Sam Presti 15 years to get to this good, right? Like he was always yeah. good, right? But yeah, it took some seasoning in the job for him to get to where he is right. now. Yeah, and so th- there's not those guys. Like, that guy's not out there, right? Like, I do think that every fan should be clamoring for a GM of, like, OKC's quality. However, that guy's not out there. That's the thing, is that, like, we all deserve to have Sam Presti. We all deserve to have, like, the three-year turnaround or whatever, but you can't get it. And the re- same same with coaching. There's a lot of decisions that, yeah, you can all say, I want to sign LeBron, but... If LeBron's not there, you can't sign him. So yeah. I do think that like Stone is good. He's maybe even quite good. He's not great, but you're not gonna. There's not a great GM out there to hire. So yeah. And this is fine. So far, it's fine. It's like it's 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 honestly better than fine. Like I I would rate this as a good out of you know the uh, the poor, fair, good, excellent scale or whatever. Yeah. So I- yeah, I don't think there's any reason not to give him like a normal contract like you said like three years or whatever at about what the league average for gms right now is i don't know they don't really talk about it very right. much but whatever they know what it is so whatever that is or like a two plus one team you know team sure. option for the last year right like i i just want to see more right i and, and like that's why i that's why i'm kind of like that's where i end up end up landing with them it's like oh you've done enough to keep your job and 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 um and, like, I'm going to keep monitoring this, right? Like, that's kind of where I'm at. Like, okay. Yeah. And it hurts that he's not helped by his pre- by his predecessor, right? To be honest, like, <laughs> Maury was so yeah. damn good. And this this, fr- this fan base, a lot of them have grown up with just Maury, right? Or, or, or did not, they don't really pay t- a lot of, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful of Rockets fans, but a lot of Rockets fans just pay attention to the Rockets front office, Right. They don't pay attention to the other front yeah. offices in the NBA. There's a lot of dog shit out there, right? And and I'm 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 just like I don't want to take the risk of collecting that dog. I want to be right here. I'm fine with this right now. <laughs> and like and I see well, and I see Stone. I could see Stone being better than this, right? Like there have been some mistakes. How about this? If Kevin Porter Jr. wasn't a human being, that's a that's a hell of a that's a hell of a hit from a talent level, right? That goes on his ledger, but that kind of stuff they just got unlucky about, right? Or yeah. hey, if if um, 
if Jalen isn't go ahead, go ahead. bone, if Tari doesn't have an unusual benign bone growth, looks a lot different, you know? Yeah. I mean, like, a lot of this is just, like, out of his hand. I don't want to say out of his hands. He selected Jalen Green over Evan Mobley, right? Like, that, that, that's, <laughs> that, that's completely in his hands. But a lot of it, um, on the margins, is out of his hands, right? Um, so, I don't know. I just, I think... We have to have a big picture. Like, with Stone, I, I just encourage fans to step back on this, right? Like, get yourself out of the weeds for a second. Look at where this front office was when he first took the job. James Harden was disgruntled. He wanted out. R- Russell Westbrook was, was, was the worst contract in basketball. <laughs> like, uh, this team had zero draft capital yeah. for, like, four years, right? They were screwed. And he turns them around in such an incredible fashion, like that first, those first series of transactions where he turned, um, Clint, where he turned Robert Covington into Trevor Ariza uh, and, and two first rounders, and then he turned Trevor Ariza into uh, Christian Wood and two first rounders, and then he turned those two, one of those two, one of those first rounders, uh, and a, uh, that West, that first rounder he got from Washington in the Westbrook trade into Alperin Shangoon. Like those are awesome moves that just get. In history, right? Yeah. <laughs> we just forgot about him, right? Like I don't know. I, I I just I would just like. I just think a lot of this, and I, and this this is me, right? I I was the guy I was the guy who was like cringing at fans making Stone into this meme, right? Like they were trying to make Stone into Mori, right? Like trust in yeah. Mori, right? Remember that was like a like uh, a thing during Maury's tenure. Yeah, and then Maury we trust, yeah. Right, and they were trying to get that picture of Stone in the locker room kind of cross-armed, like, into, like, oh, this is our guy. He doesn't mess up, right? <laughs> it's like, like no, he, he, he had some clear mistakes, and I was pushing back on that in the beginning of his tenure, right? I've been able to have an objective view on this guy, and I feel like if you if, if the fans would just take a step back, they can share that with me. Same, same with Forrest, you know? <laughs> What, what I'm going to say about Rockets fans, and I'm saying this as a compliment, and I want to make that very clear, is I feel like Rockets fans' level of like entitledness to team success, that ratio is maybe the highest of like anybody in the league. The Rockets fans really expect the moon, and I that's good to me. I want to be very clear. I think it's really good that Rockets fans are demanding, that Rockets fans... like need excellence at all times but it does make them have a tendency to, to to do things like you said like turn rafael stone into some kind of a superhero to fill in the role of the previous excellent gm right so they yes. memified uh, stone right before he yes. before and, he even took the basically took the job and everybody and everybody everyone on the team whoever they all the players they pick are the best guy in history until they show themselves not to be the best guy in history and then, the worst and guy then history. they are out yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh so in terms of Rafael Stone I agree with you there's no reason not to extend him for like a reasonable extension if someone of like Presti's caliber came available and wanted to wanted to run the rockets you hire him instantly and you boot Stone to the curb without a second thought but that guy's not going to come available and is not currently available. So don't make decisions based on that. If it happens, it happens. If you know you have a better guy available, whatever. But it's not going to happen. Don't plan on it happening. Just keep the solid quality front office you have right now. Hope it gets better and keep an eye out for the future. And I, I don't know. It's a, it's very pragmatic, I feel like. Yeah, and I want to I want to emphasize, like, these guys get better at the job, right? For like, I, yeah. like Presti is a great example of a guy who's gotten genuinely better at the job. He was always good, right? But he became phenomenal, right? At some point in the last five years, right? Like, um, he he's this is the same guy who who was like people would not let this guy get off the mat for the Harden trade. People would not let him live that down for the longest time, and I was like. Dude, this guy's awesome, and, and he's done such a great job. Can we just let this go, right? And it finally feels like people will finally let this go, but now people are like, oh, we, like people just forget the mistakes, right? And now people are like, oh, we don't we don't remember the Harden trade, right? It's like it's like people are so easy to remember 
Like, the Jalen Green pick is so fresh in everyone's memory. And part of it is because he's just taking so many shots every night. <laughs> and it's just in everyone's face every night. That he's the highest pick in franchise history since Yao Ming. And he's, he was a miss. Right? I think, I think that... Is I think that's probably the biggest reason it's hard for people to be objective about, about this. Is that he had such a he had such a big miss, right? That it's it colors everything. It colors everything. Yeah, and also fans are gonna be like, "Why aren't we contenders yet?" I mean, I want I want the team to be contenders again. Yeah, but it's not gonna happen until it's gonna happen. So we always want more. We always want more than what we're given, which is fine, but. You have to know what's realistic and what's reasonable to get. Can I? I have a question. So, yeah, what do you think? Are both any of our grades or the perspective on Stone overall would be different had they lost the coin toss in twenty twenty one, the second overall pick? Let's just say they had second twenty three and twenty four, and they took they, they the only thing that came with that draft was Shangun and Usman Garuba, Josh Christopher, or whatever. Um, do you think? we'd be viewing this a lot differently if they hadn't just have this giant miss, if they never selected at number two. That's a good question. Yeah, if they just ended up conveying that pick instead. Mm -hmm. uh, I do feel like I'd give him at least a half-letter grade more. Like, I think that it's like a half-letter grade for making the choice mm -hmm. of uh, of Jalen Green. And I have the opposite question for you. If they managed to win the lottery in that year... And take Cade? If they had the first overall pick. Yeah. I mean, do they take Cade or do they... It seemed like they really like Jalen. Do they take Jalen at number one? I think they were going to take Cade. Uh, because they were talking... take Cade. Yeah, there, were, there was talk about them trying to trade out for number two and taking Cade. Well, if they take Cade, how does that affect... If they go to one and take Cade, how does that affect your grade? Um, I can't knock them from taking for taking the consensus number one. Right? Like, I, I can't knock Detroit for yeah. taking the consensus number one. Right? Troy... Troy Weaver is just doing what all what the twenty nine other general managers were, just did, right? We're gonna do that night. Like I, I can't. Yeah. Yeah. It just it's it's not. Who's the thirtieth? Hold on. Who's the thirtieth? Well, him. Oh, I guess we had others. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, yeah. I. Uh, that's a good. It's a. It's a good. It's a good. I mean, I feel like it, it, we end up at the same effect, right? I feel like I'd still have like, like a little better. Yeah, a yeah. little bit better, right? It's just the green thing. It's just so damn. E even if he had just taken. Jalen Suggs instead of Evan Morgan <laughs> instead of Jalen Green, right? Like, Jalen Suggs is awesome, and he fits actually a lot better than Jalen Green on this roster comes to construct, right? He's kind of the exact player that they need. Great defensively, good three-point shooter, um, just a solid player that helps you win games. Someone that Jalen isn't right now, right? Yeah, but they weren't, they weren't trying for that. Yeah. They were trying for the guy. Right. Which I understand. All right, I right, about this because that was a top four protected pick, right? So they, if they got one, two, three, or four, what if they picked Jalen Green at three or four? How would you feel? That's kind of where I, like, I, I think that would have been the right pick if they take. Yeah, like if it was like four, you're probably like, yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and if it's three, you're like, mm, yeah, like, like, yeah, the same thing. Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, we would give them like literally if they landed in every. I think what we're finding is any other they, position then too. Yeah. <laughs> like we, yeah. would, we would give him a half letter grade, which is kind of. Does that make you rethink? No, I, I don't think it makes you rethink no. things, right? Because they, <laughs> no, they, they, they still took the swing, yeah. right? They ultimately, you, yeah, yeah. We can only grade them on what they did. We can't grade them on what they could have or would have done, right? And you know, they, they took swings at other points in the draft, like taking jo Josh Christopher at twenty three was a swing. Right, like that was not at all the obvious pick. I, I think the obvious pick there was like no. Quentin Grimes, right? Even at the time, I was like, oh, why aren't they taking Quentin Grimes? Who, who's Josh Christopher, right? Uh, and I, not I, like Josh Christopher was mocked in the early '30s, right? I'm not gonna say who's Josh Christopher, but like, you know, it was it was a it was a reach. They wanted they swung for the guy with some with some shot creation ability, right? Off the off the bounce uh, and, and real athleticism, and they did that. They swung and they swung and they swung that night, and they did land on one swing. But the problem is, they missed on like the the most important swing, the biggest one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the, there was there was a fastball right down the middle, and they missed on that one. Right, and that's 
yeah, that makes you go. Oh. Yeah, I it, it's 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 interesting. I mean, I, and you know, I I think I, a lot of this again, a lot of this is just luck. Like, if they had gotten Wemben Yama this year, right? Yeah, right. Like that completely changes our perspective on. With the, with the Rockets. Yeah, about. but I don't know if it actually makes me grade them any better. You don't like, think so? I don't, like, in a similar way to how I don't really, like... If they got Wemby Cam or... in a draft, I mean... Yeah, but I would... But, like, getting Cam... I'd still think Cam is a really great pick, but I wouldn't be, like, more impressed with the front office, right? Because it was an obvious like, selection, yeah. Because it's obvious selection, yeah. Just like how, like, picking Jabari Smith was, like, obviously the right choice. They don't get dinged because they made the obviously right choice, but they also don't, like, it doesn't really move their credit up either. Like, it just, it just is like, yeah, obviously you, you know what you're doing, but this isn't a sign of, like, excellence or mediocrity. This is just, like, that's just a, a green flag, nothing more. So I think that getting Wembanyama would definitely have shown them to be luckier, but it, I don't think it would have shown them to be better, if that makes sense. You know, I'd almost like like to see what we'd give them if they just hit some of these late first rounders, right? Like um, if they had hit on um, on twenty three and they take they taken Quinn Grimes, or if they had hit on if they selected someone other than Ty Ty Washington, right? Or like you know like like if these yeah. if they got some of these marginal first rounders, right, right? Like but like here's the thing: half the league misses on these guys. Like they're so yeah. Hard the thing to is, hit. no one does that. Yeah. Yeah. Like well. Like their hit rate is really good currently. Yeah. Even even with Jalen even with Jalen Green looking like he's not going to work out, which again, he still could work out. I want him to work out and make this whole conversation look stupid. But even with that, like, it's a really good hit rate, man. It's it's yeah. what like five out of what is it like? They had like nine first rounders. I think nine. Yeah. I think yeah, yeah, like five out of nine looking really good is really good. Yeah, like that's that's the I mean. Even the even the Thunder miss on draft picks sometimes. They just wave Poku, you know. They don't they don't end up keeping all the guys they pick. They do actually get a few of them wrong. They just get enough of them right that they have a whole team that is fantastic out of the deal. And that's that's all you got to do. You don't need to make every single draft pick a star. You just need to have enough quality players that your team is really good. An- another move to hit on um, the KJ Martin selection, right? Like they they, they trade yeah. they got they they got KJ Martin for cash. And then they traded him for two seconds, right? Like, it, it just got lumped into that giant Brook Lopez trade, so no one really thinks about it. But they they tra- they turned yeah. cash into two second rounders, right? Like, like it's like, you know, the, the, this kind of stuff is just it's just hard to we like memory hold a lot of this stuff. <laughs> like, well, it's hard to keep track of. There's so much of it. Yeah. Yeah, you, know, you gotta have those weird charts that show like all the little trades going together into right. the one big trade or whatever. Right. We'll see how he how he lands this plane with the rebuild, right? I think that's going to be important, right? That that's perhaps a way he can improve, uh, even uh, better than what what, he, what we think he have we have him right now, right? Like how he manages the Jalen Green thing. The the worst thing he could possibly do is double down, right, on that mistake, right? If it's a mistake, the worst thing you could do is double down on it by giving him some ridiculous contract or like refusing to trade him past his time, past the time it's time to trade him, whatever it is. You, that's that's an important decision he's got to make. The, the the star trade, right? Which we all think is likely uh, something that could happen, right? Uh, it's something they're angling for. I'll put it that way. Yeah, it's something they're they're really looking for, right? Uh, what they do, who they get, what they give up for, what they get, that plays into it. What they select in this next draft, right? This this is a hell yeah. of a conundrum. To have a high pick in this draft, uh, where nobody knows who the hell should go number one, nobody uh, really wants to be in this draft, but yet they're in, they're staying in this draft and they're going to have a good pick in this draft. Um, what they do with that selection, yeah. if they if they pick, if they trade that pick, or you know, like like there's so many variables left um, yeah. that could change this. I think the the way the short way I'd put it is that. When it's time for the Rockets to be good again, which is coming up very soon, how good the team is at that is going to be a very important litmus test on the front office more than anybody else. Like, because they have, I think, one more season. Like, they can kind of not be particularly good this next season. If they're just like, they need to be better than this year, obviously. They have to be better than this year. But 
if they're just kind of a middling team next season, I think you can sort of get away with that. But if they can't put together like a real winning team in the 2025-26 season, that's a huge demerit. That's that's where the critical time. They're in they're getting into their critical time. This next year to year and a half is super super important to land for this team and I think that's also one of the hard things. It's very hard to actually put together a real good team. And I think whether or not Stone in the front office can do that is going to It's like we've given him the first midterm grade and then the second semester has started this season and we need to see how he does in the second semester now. For sure. Uh, I mean, like, where I end up with him is, like, I put him in, like, the David Griffin, Justin Zanuck tier of general managers. Pretty good GMs, right? Like, I think those guys are, are have done commendable jobs with their teams. Uh, but uh, they're not upper echelon, right? They're, they're not they're not top, tippy-top yeah. guys, right? They're, they're, those, guys are, those guys are good, and, they're, like, you'd be very happy to have them as a general manager. But, like, perhaps you could do better if, like, you know, yeah, I mean, we'll just see. We're just going to have to see. And what he does on the margins when he when they are a good team, that's often how we judge these guys, right? Like, Maury was awesome yeah. at finding guys off the scrap heap uh, for minimums, for mid-level exceptions, managing the cap to, so there was a way to improve even after they're a good team, right? Like, that stuff's going to be important, too. So, yeah, I mean, you're right. We have a lot We have a lot to see with with Rafael. Well, I think we're going to see it. So, it'll be fun. For sure. Uh, thank you so much for coming on, Forrest. Uh, if you guys enjoyed the podcast, again, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Give us a thumbs up on this video. And yeah, guys. Thumbs up down there. Yes, thumbs up. Is it going to show up? <laughs> Whatever it is. Give, give us a thumbs up. And yeah, guys, I'll talk to you down the road.